right here. You know, you can't have feelings and hope without his presence. And so that's what I want to talk to you today about. His healing and hope in his presence. So, and it comes from Luke 8, uh, verses 40 through 56, I believe it is. And it's the story of, y'all familiar with this, of the dead girl and the sick woman. And in Luke 8, 40 and 42, it says, Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, I guess I pronounced that right, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. Um, the people were waiting for Christ with an expectation. You know, I think about that today. Do we expect something from God? You know, we come to church, we come and, and assemble, but do we expect to see Christ? They were waiting, expecting to see him. And this man came with a passion because his daughter needed help. You see, he came to Jesus because his daughter needed help. He was waiting on Jesus, and he wasn't too proud to stand down and, and, and ask Christ for help. And so that's the way we've got to come to Jesus, with a passion and a desire to see him move in our midst. You see, not just haphazardly come, not just come and say, well, we might see something today, we might not, or we might feel his presence today, we might not. No, we've got to come with an expectation yeah. of God, you see, of seeing God. And so it says in 43 and 44, as Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched him on the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. You see, these two people here, they had hope that Christ could do something. That's right. You see, they were wanting to be in his presence because they had hope that he could heal the other way. You see, that's the way we've got to come to church. That's right. We don't see healings, well, we really have healings, but we just don't know about them, I think. But we don't see them like we uh, expect because we don't come in that desire first of all, and with that hope to see it. You know, I find it interesting that she was 12 years old and that lady had been bleeding for 12 years. Now what that means, I don't know, but it just sort of struck me as odd that both of these situations started about the same time or, you know, but and God had been working on them at the same time. You know, nothing happens in God by accident. You know, the older I get, and the, 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 the older in Christ I get, I realize that I go places and see people not by accident, but God has appointed, you see. And if we think about it that way, then we start looking, why am I here? What purpose is it? Is it? You see what I'm saying? Our mindset changes, and that's the way we've got to do it as Christians. Our mindset has got to change. But she just wanted to touch his clothes. If she could grab the hem of his garment, she felt like she might be healed, you see. She had that desire. You know, the Holy Spirit so many times tells us, you know, I know one time I was sitting right here on this, right, right here, praying for healing. I was, I, I, look how close I was to the front. You know, and I was stretching out my hand, wanting to heal, and I had a bad cough for many years. And God said, you have not because you asked not. Now I was asking for it right there on that road. But when I hit this pew right here, I got my healing. I hadn't had that cough since. See. And I was getting it every spring for a whole month or two. A bad call. But I had to move from here to there. How far is that? Like 10 foot. But until I did that, God didn't move. You see? And so he was telling me that. This lady touched his garment, and I have a feeling that maybe. She was preempted to do that. But when she did, verse 44 says, just touch his clothes. The gospel often speaks of the sick, sick 
touching Jesus. He said, that's where we got to get to. We got to get to that place that we desire to touch Jesus. Even the hem of his garment. Mark 3.10 says, For he had healed many, so those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Are we pushing forward to touch God? Is that why we maybe are not seeing healings like we ought to be seeing in the service? It's because we're not pushing forward to touch Christ. You see, we got to overcome that, that fear of I don't know what, what it is. The fear of not acting. You know, the fear of not doing. The fear of not coming forward to touch Christ. And, and so if we look at Mark 6, 56, it says, And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his clothing. And all who touched him were healed. Is that the way we come to worship? That's my question for today. That metal sign right there. His presence is our passion. Is that really real? Is that really real in our lives? Is that really real in our hearts? Do we deserve, really desire that? Or are we just going through the motions? And so many times as Christians, I think we're just going through the motions. Maybe it's only me, you know? But God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And, and, and so Christ is here today. He wants to touch us. Secondly, of Jesus is touching the sick. Matthew 8, 3 says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched them. And he said, I am willing. I am willing. He is willing to touch us today. Then he told them, be clean. You know, Christ can't speak without action happening. You know, in the, in the beginning, Christ spoke and things happened. He was there with God. He said, let us make man. You know, who is us? That's God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You see, the Trinity was there all the time. And, and so, Christ can't speak without action happening. He said, be clean. And immediately, he was cured of his leprosy. Nothing is too hard for God. Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drew, out, uh, drew out the spirits with a word and healed the sick. I'm sorry, drove out. I can't even read my own right. Drove out the spirits and with a word and heal the sick. This was to fulfill the spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up, up our infirmities and carried our diseases. How many times do we bring, it's like when we have prayer quests this morning, we've got to bring our needs before God. That's the way we know it's God doing it. You know, there's so many things that we can't do, but nothing is too hard for him. It was the contact in the presence of Jesus that mattered. Let me read that statement. It was the contact and presence of Jesus that mattered. That's what matters, folks. His touch was healing power because he sympathizes with our weaknesses and is a source of life and grace. He's our source of life grace. The greatest touch we get is salvation. You know, that's the greatest touch we get. Life ever after. You know, I wonder if we miss God so many times because we don't bring the sick. We don't bring the needy. You know, it's weird easily to take them to the doctor or to the hospital or to the emergency room. And I'm not saying that that's not necessary. But how many times do we bring them to the altar? You say, how many times do we bring them to the one who can really heal? And so that's what I just want to just try to make you think about that this morning. Hebrews 4, 16 said, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace 
to help us in our time of need. Let me read that verse again. It said, let us then approach the throne of grace. Approach the throne of grace. Notice there, it's us moving. You see, it's us moving toward God. He says, if we move toward him, he'll move toward us. You see, with confidence, so many times we have let downs. The devil wants us to have downs. You know, he wants us to let down. We've got to move with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It is called the throne of grace because from it flow God's love, help, mercy, forgiveness, wisdom, spiritual power, spiritual gifts, the fruits of the spirit, and all that we need in any circumstance. I like the way you put that. And all that we need in any circumstance. That's why we go to the throne. One of the great blessings of salvation is that Christ Jesus is now our high priest, our mediator, who opens the way for us to come to the Father with confidence for all areas of our need in our lives. He opens the way. He's there for us that we might come boldly because when we come, we come with him as our advocator, as him as our lawyer, you know. Who better to stand in for you than Christ Jesus? You see? And, and, and so I just want to raise up your confidence this morning. That God is able and willing to do that which is exceedingly above all things we hope for or even can ask. Or maybe I got that backwards. Ask for or even hope. You know. Wow. Think about that. We can't even imagine what God can do. Our minds are so uh, finite that we can't even imagine what God can do. In other words, that's telling me that we hold him back because we can't imagine what he can do. So if we can't imagine it, how are we going to ask for it? You see? But he says the Holy Spirit, he moans and groans for things we can't even ask for. And so if we just apply ourselves and apply our faith what little we have, God can do exceedingly above all those things that we even ask or hope for. Our responsibility in seeking healing is to draw near to Jesus and live in his presence. Let me read that again. Our responsibility in seeking healing is to draw near to Jesus and live in his presence. And so that's where we've got to get to. That's why that middle one is so important. That's where it begins. That's where it starts at, in his presence. And so let's draw unto him. And man, let's just expect something good to happen today. As we come to church today, as we have worship today, let's just expect that God's going to just blow our minds. You see? That's the kind of expectation we got to have. We can't be satisfied with the same old, same old. You see? What kept those people in the upper room? A lot of them left. But they weren't satisfied with what they had. They knew something was more. And they weren't going to leave. They were like the one that wrestled God. They weren't going to leave till he touched them. That's the kind of attitude we got to come to church with. We're not going to leave God till you fulfill that which you're going to do today. You see, with that kind of expectation, that's our responsibility. Matthew 17, 20 says, He replied, Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have the faith of the small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I don't care what mountain you have in your life, God is greater. It says, greater is he that is in us than he is in this world. But we don't walk that way so many times. Think about anxiety in this world today. How many people have so much anxiety they can't even move, you see? That's the that's lie of the devil. That's not to say that we don't have things come against us, but that's not to say that we can't overcome them either through Christ Jesus. Our expectation has got to be that he's, he's there for us. Luke 8, 45 said, Christ said, Who touched me? Jesus asked when they all denied it. Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. There's Peter again, you know. Who touched me? 
Christ knows when we touch it or when we ask for something that is in his will. Maybe that's a better way to say it. He wanted to heal. He wants to heal us. Now, it might not be the kind of healing that we think, you know, because the ultimate healing is going to be with God for eternity. That's our ultimate healing. But he wants us to walk in God's will. You see, that's where we get on when we get close to him. We're, the closer we are to him, the more to God's will we are. Maybe that's a good way to put it. You see? It, because you can't get close to him by getting closer to God's will. Because that's where he's at, found it. And so if we can't find Christ, then we're, we're not headed in the right direction. And, and, and so that's what God wants us to, to, to see. Who touched me? None save this poor sufferer touched him in the dear sense of touching with the fixed idea that contact with his blessed person would benefit them or heal them. Think about that. It said all those people were there waiting on Christ. When we come to church, all these people are here waiting on Christ. But there was one there that really wanted to touch. There was one there that wasn't going to leave until she got that touch. There was one there that was going to try everything she could to be healed, you see. And Christ said, who touched me? And the disciples didn't realize that that person wanted Christ that much, wanted to be in his presence that much. They said, everybody's here to see you. Everybody wants to be around you. Everybody wants to touch you. But Christ realized that there was that one there that needed his healing touch, you see. And he wanted to make them known. He knew what happened. He knew that they'd been healed. And so... Uh, Luke 46 says, Somebody touched me. I know that the power has gone from me. In other words, the healing is gone. You see? The healing is gone. Christ was there for a purpose, and that was to touch this lady. And so 47 and 48 says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go <laughs> notice, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. <clears throat> she told why she touched him said that she had been instantly healed. She gave a testimony right there. You know what's up? We need to give a testimony right there. Why wait? You know, so many times, have you ever sat back there and said, I, I really don't want to say this. I just really don't want to go down. You know, I've done that several times. Are you really God? Really, you want me to say that? Really God? Really? I don't believe. You sure? You sure? You know, it was time for a testimony because this lady had instantly been healed. She knew it, you know? I wondered, I often wonder about that. How, you know, she bled. I don't know how she bled, but she knew she had been healed immediately. She had confidence. Her faith had made her well, you see. That's the way we've got to go to God. <clears throat> and, and so she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. That's the greatest thing about being in Christ's presence, is you can go in peace. Because he gives us that peace only he understands. And think about this. All this time, here's Jairus, or Jairus, or however you say his name. I'm the world's worst pronouncer of names. The only thing worse than my pronunciation is my spelling. But uh, here he is. His daughter's dying. You know, he's having to hold up and wait on this lady. You know, I'd be really impatient. You ever been really impatient waiting on God? Come on, God. I've been praying about this for years and years. Been at the altar 15 times, 20 times. You know, this other person's going to get a healing. Now, here I am. It's all in God's time. Those who wait upon the Lord. You see, that's what we've got to do. We've got to ask, and then we've got to wait with a confidence that it's going to happen. You see. So, 49 and 50 says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue, uh, from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. The doubters. There are going to be doubters in you here. You know, you used to see them little cartoons that have an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder and they're both talking to you. 
Well, that's probably not true, really. You know, there's two people trying to influence you, and that's the Holy Spirit and the devil. And we, who are you going to listen to? You see? Who is Josh going to listen to? Is he going to listen to this man telling him, no, don't bother the teacher anymore, don't worry about it. You know, she's already dead, can't help her. Or is he going to listen to God? He's going to continue that confidence that he had. You see, that's what we've got to decide as we go to God wanting to heal him, as we go to God wanting hope. We've got to decide, who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the world? You know, you turn on that TV and it'll make you so mad or upset or de disappointed or depressed or what you just put in a word. Because that's the worldly way. If we would turn on our Bible as much as we turn on our TV, we would have a whole lot more peace and joy. And I'm talking to myself. I'm trying to wean myself from all that stuff. You know, but it just sucks you in sometimes. You see? That's what the world wants to do. It wants to tell you there's no hope. There's no future. There's no healing. But God's all about that. He's all about that. And so, verse 50, here in this, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. And she will be healed. You can just put it in there, whatever it is you want to see God do. Don't be afraid, just believe. You know, we read a while ago, if you have a grain of mustard seed, you know, one time I was teaching class and I brought a little mustard seed, and it's hard to keep up with that thing. You know, them things are so small, if you, if you let it, It'll roll off and then you'll never find it in the car. You see? That's how small the mustard seed. That's how small relies on us to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. But it does rely a little bit on something. You see? We've got to have a little bit of that faith. And, and, and so that's what Christ said to him. Just believe. She will be healed. Jesus' response was to encourage the Father's faith even in this seamlessly hopeless situation. Throughout redemptive history, believers have been placed their trust in God, even when it seems as if it was always lost in such times. God gave the necessity, necessitary faith and delivers his people according to his will and his purpose. Let me read that again because I'll put it. God gave the necessity, necessitary, necessity, I can say that word. Yeah. Just a regular necessity. He gave the faith necessary. That's what I'm looking for, necessary. <clears throat> and delivered his people according to his will and his purpose. God just don't leave us out there on the island. It says, and I paraphrase here, that he's not going to place anything more on you than you can stand. You see? He's not setting you up for failure. He's setting you up for success, to be your faith. And it starts out with something small, but it's supposed to blossom and bloom and be fruitful and multiply into something so big that it can't be denied. You see, that's what's going on here. Christ is acting and it can't be denied. Here's a lady that had been suffering blood for 12 years and now she's healed. That can't be denied. Because people have been seeing her for 12 years. All the doctors have not seen her for 12 years. You see, when Christ moved, people can't deny it. And that's the best testimony we have. That's the best witness that we have to who God really is. Luke 8, 51 and 52. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, or Jairus, or however you pronounce that, he did not let anyone go with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's mother and father. See, we can't allow doubters in the place. You know, I, I've often wondered how many times did I give the move of God by the way I went to church? Because I was thinking of more things than just what God was thinking about. My mindset was not that where it needed to be. I'm afraid I've been guilty from it. See, when we come to Christ, when we come to church, we've got to come with an expectation of seeing God work, God move. God's presence. That's what it's all about. And we're not going to see God's presence if we got other things on our mind. You see? And so we've got to keep a sharp focus because the devil wants to interrupt us. He wants to get our minds off of God. 
And so nobody went in there except those who were ready. Those who were mindset was right. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Our Lord's object was to silence the idle uproar. The idle uproar. Worldly response. Think about the worldly's response this morning. You know when I put a text in my uh, uh, in my phone and I put God in there, it won't go with God. You know how they put the little words up there? It'll go with God with an S, but it won't go to just God. Why? It's a worldly response. You see, the devil does all he can to keep us from walking in faith, from our faith growing. It's a worldly response. Let's look at 54 and 55. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told him to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. When God speaks, nothing happens. You see, that's why the devil don't want it. That's why he's all against the move of God, allowing the Spirit to have his way. It's because God's presence can't come in a place without things happening. People being healed, physically, spiritually. You know, the devil walks around like a roaring lion. And what lions do? They roar real big, and real big. But what they pray to do? You know, like you see them little cartoons, people stand there, shaking, <laughs> can't move. That's where we get. If you can't move, you're easy to catch when you're not moving. Have you ever thought about that? Roar line, he just sneak over there, gotcha. And it all happened because you were listening to his roar. The anxiety of it. You see, that's a favorite tool of the devil, anxiety. Because when you're, in anxiety, when you're in anxiety, you can't move. When you're in fear, you can't move. But God's love overcomes all that fear. But in perfect faith, there is no fear. The more we fear, the less we believe. Let me read that statement again. This fellow wrote this, and I thought this was really good. But in perfect faith, there is no fear. The more we fear, the less we believe. We've got to overcome that fear through Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ. And, and so if we can just do that, the hand of Christ's grace goes with the call of his word to make them effective. Let me read that. The hand of Christ's grace, gave, grace goes with the cause of his word to make them effective. In other words, God's movements, God's Grace lines up with his word. So if you want to know what God can do or what God's going to do, read his word. Look at his word because it's the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. God's will is the same. His purpose is the same. And so if we want to know what God's going to do, look at his word. It lines up. The things he do lines up. To make it more effective. That's what's the difference between uh, a Christian in a, any other kind of religion. It's, it's living. It's a living relationship. So that's what makes it effective. So people can understand. Christ commanded to give her some meat. As babes, newborns, to those newly raised from sin, desire spiritual food. Do you desire spiritual food? That's a good check. Or are you just satisfied with the same old sound, same one? So that they may grow thereby. And what I'm going to say here this morning is don't be satisfied where you are. Don't be content where you are. But desire to know more of Christ. Desire to get closer to Christ. 
You see, because if you're not moving forward, if you're not moving toward God, if you're not moving toward that throne of grace, then you've either stopped or turned and walked away. Well, you can't walk away until you stop. And so as long as we're moving forward, we're growing in Christ. It might be baby steps. You know, sometimes it's hard, you know. But what God wants us to realize today is if you want hope, if you want healing, desire is in his presence. And if we'll do that, if we'll just get in that place where he's there, then we can reach out and touch his coat. He can come and heal the sick. You see, he can save our lost ones. He's able to will him to do that which is exceedingly above all things we can ask or even hope for. Stuff we don't even know about with us. You know, I think that's what's going to be when we get to heaven. When we start learning what all God did for us and we didn't even have a clue. Even before we were saved, we're going to say, how great is our God? We don't know because we can't comprehend him. But we can comprehend that he loves us he sent his son to die for us and that all we have to do is come into his presence and the rest will take care of itself. Father we thank you for today we thank you for your word God as it challenges us today to put aside the things of this world and to grab hold of the things in your presence let us come boldly before the throne of grace that you may accomplish all that you want to accomplish before your son Jesus returns to this earth. What a glorious day that's going to be. What a healing that's going to be. But God, let us not stand in the way, but let us run with you. In Jesus' name.